Anyway, uh, without further ado, Peter G3LAT, you have front and center stage, and thank you for being here. No problem. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. I don't see any ladies, but gentlemen, thank you very much for your interest in what went on uh, 60 over years ago now. Um, I'd like to just start this off, if I may, with a very brief health warning. Um, as this pr presentation may be subject to public viewing on YouTube, um, most of the events de depicted in this presentation took place in the early 1960s, at which time the concept of political correctness had yet to be uh, developed, <laughs> let alone observed. Uh, so some terms or phrases used therefore reflect the norms of the period rather than those of today. Uh, this presentation also describes and depicts harm done to animals by base members at Sydney Station and others with the concurrence or indeed under the instruction of their employees at the time, including, um, without exclusivity, government departments of the United Kingdom and Norway. Now, some people might find that such terms, uh, etc., uh, may find them upsetting. And if you feel that you may fall into this category, you are advised not to watch this presentation. So now I've, I've done that now. OK, can I have the first slide up now, now uh, please, Dave? There you go. OK, let me just... OK, yeah, that's fine. OK, so this is about the early 1960s, how things were. This is why I've put the, the little warning in there, because things happened a little bit differently in those days. So this presentation was originally given uh, on, a, on, uh, on a cruise line uh, around about 1927, uh, yeah, 2017, I think. And, and uh, these guys, of course, paid quite a lot of money uh, John, of course, knows exactly how much money it takes to get on the air down in Sydney nowadays. Um, whereas I was actually paid uh, the princely sum of about $1,000 a year, I suppose, to uh, spend my time there as a wireless operator, part-time cook, diesel mech, and met observer. So that's the first slide. And this is me. Um, we, we had two short teams of dogs. So we had a total of eight dogs, which were uh, chained up behind the hut on, on uh, chain spans. And um, the idea was that the dogs should be kept separate from the, the, the bitches in particular. And of course, it didn't always happen that way. And so we ended up with some unplanned um, pups. Um, unfortunately, soon after I left, uh, it was decided that uh, the dogs were to be no more. And so these little, these little guys were shot shortly afterwards, I'm, I'm afraid, but there we go. Uh, okay, next slide, and this is me. So I, I went back uh, 56 years later in 2017 with my good lady to show her where I'd been. And um, so this was in the Falklands. And this is Waterloo Station. Anybody been to the UK? I don't know. I'm sure you have. Um, but UK people will note that some of, the, some of the signs are the same and some of the signs are different. We had a, a news theatre in the station at that time before the, the advent of too much television, I suppose. So that's where we started off in London. Next, uh, And so then we came down to Southampton, and that is uh, Royal Research Ship Shackleton, uh, with some family members probably seeing the guys off on board there, and just tied up uh, as well. Quite a, quite a small boat, about 1,200 tonnes, I think it was, altogether. And there we are having our, having having supper in our in our, our mess deck. So we were all around about twenty one to twenty three years old, and we'd all applied to an advertisement for the for the for these jobs 
in a periodical called Wireless World, which is a UK radio publication, been going since at least the 1920s. And there was a, about a two-inch box, a uh, small ad in the back pages, wanted um, wireless operator mechanics or diesel mechs or met observers for the Falkland Island Dependencies Survey, it was called in those days. Uh, later on, it was revised to British Antarctic Survey. So these were, these were some of the guys. And hardly any of us had actually been outside the UK at that age because before the age of mass air travel, so few of us had even been as far as France. I certainly hadn't. And so we ended up as the first port of call in Montevideo, which was quite an eye-opener. Uh, we ended up in the British Overseas Airways Corporation office uh, because it was air con and, of course, it was bloody hot there. So there we go. Next one. Uh, so after that, we came down to Port Stanley, or Stanley, as I think as it's now known. Um, the only houses of con traditional construction there are those um, uh, four terrace houses just to the right of centre there. The rest of them were all wooden uh, with corrugated iron roofs. And um, unfortunately, I lost my camera um, on my way back from Sydney. And um, so I've got no photographs of my actual operation in South Georgia or the Falklands, but Dave VP8HJ's house that I operated from is one of those houses up to the top, uh, up near the top of that hill there. Okay. And there's the, um, there's the cathedral. and. That view is very, very similar to what it was when we went back in 2017. Um, there's a whalebone arch just to the right. You can, uh, difficult to see, but uh, there's a blue whale um, arch just to the right of the cathedral on the ground there, which is like a legacy of the, the old whaling days when the UK were also involved. Okay, next slide. And there is the Lady Elizabeth. This was an 1800s uh, sailing schooner, which somehow fell on hard times and ended up anchored in Port Stanley Harbor there. And if you look at the next slide, uh, 60 years later, it's almost exactly the same. Even that yard arm in the middle is still at the same angle. Uh, and that was used for storing um, Sheep's wool, I think, probably by the government in between uh, exports back to the UK. And these are the extent of the defences from the Second World War. So uh, when the Argentinians came to um, invade in 82, that was the sort of um, uh, things that they saw there. Uh, in fact, when we went down to the Falklands and we first appeared at the, uh, at the, at the uh, landing stage there, we were greeted by the entire extent of the Falkland Islands Defence Force, which was half a dozen uh, privates and a corporal, I believe. So we knew exactly what the Argies um, uh, met when they came in 1982. And then... On we went to South Georgia, and that in the foreground there is the government offices. And towards the middle, just to the right, is the taller of the three masts there. And that I was given a halyard, and I could put up an aerial there. And I operated from the little red roof building just immediately behind the base of that mast there. Uh, and I operated for a whole two weeks because I, I was evacuated from Sydney, uh, left there to do a, a, a two-week job, and uh, I was able to operate in the early mornings and in the evenings. All the rest of the time, I was I was uh, busy with my uh, my my actual work. After all, I was being paid for all this. Okay, next one, and so. Now, that's, that's from a slightly different angle, but behind now 
you see the uh, Gritvik and Whaling Station, and that's still in full production. It was the last year of operation by, by Norway, um, and it looks quite, looks sort of okay there because it was a nice bright day, but look at the next slide. Um, that's how it appeared when you got close up to it. Uh, all the chimneys, the digesters for the um, oil, the whale oil. There was a canning factory there uh, as well for dog food, I believe, for, 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 for the whale meat. And um, it was quite a frightening place, really, to be perfectly honest. Um, it was a long... The, 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 this had been going since the early years of the uh, 20th century, this whaling station, and all of the whales in the immediate vicinity of South Georgia had long gone. And so the catchers, you see a couple of catchers down to the left there, the catcher boats, um, they used to bring whales in from up to 250 miles away. That's how, how uh, much the whale population had been decimated. Next one. And here is a blue whale. This had been hauled in from wherever uh, by one of the catchers, and it was waiting to be hauled up onto the plan, which was the wooden planked area. And uh, the birds there are all Cape pigeons looking for food and obviously getting some bits and pieces from it. Um, blue whales were already very rare and um, were not supposed to be caught. And in fact, it was already entered. It was entered as a fin whale, but uh, it was clearly a blue whale. Next one. And there it is being hauled up or having been hauled up onto, onto the plan. You see a couple of uh, uh, people with flensing knives just to the right by the head, uh, cutting away at bits and pieces and the two explosive harpoons uh, on uh, the bottom have been re extracted for reuse. Uh, this was the last year of whaling by the Norwegians. It was supposed to be taken over by the Japanese. We're never sure whether that happened or not, but um, this was the fleet of, of, of whale catchers at a harbour just around the corner, Leith, ready to be de decommissioned. And we were offered these for sale, a thousand dollars each cash. And that included uh, a tank full of, one tank full of fuel, but, but you had to sail the thing home and you got, you got no crew. So uh, nobody took that up, I don't think. Next one. And that's this one remained unsold. We, uh, I, I took my wife back in, in 2017 and this one, uh, the petrol was still anchored there, much as it had been in, uh, 60 years before. And now this also in very close to um, uh, the, the Grip Vic and Whaling Station is the, the Shackleton Memorial. Um, you see the Whaling Station in the background with the smoke coming out of the chimneys. And there you see the, the cross in quite pristine condition with snow on it and snow on the, um, the intervening area and on the mountains. And then the next one, 60 years later, a little bit of disrepair there and look at where the snow has gone. I mean, the tussock grass has grown right up. Uh, so global warming is not a fallacy by any means because this was the same time of year as we went last time. Uh, this is my good lady. We went down. This was in the La Mer Channel, which was probably 10 degrees south of, 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 of Sydney. And uh, there she is sunning her knees. It was such a warm day. Now, here's the base as we, uh, as we um, approached it. Uh, that's Factory Cove. Um, it must have been... Um, uh, approaching the winter season because we've started to see sea ice there with some, some old ice uh, out in the, in the bay. Uh, Coronation Island is the big island at the back there. 
and the hut uh, you see there, along with the coal store and things of that nature. So that's where we spent uh, two years of our lives. It was an old uh, sealer's hut, uh, and you see it again in the next slide. Uh, there it is. Uh, later on in the winter now, everything is frozen over. And you see there's an igloo that we all built. So we, 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 we all took turns in sleeping in that overnight to see what the experience was like. Um, and here is the armorial crest. Uh, Semper in excreta. You'll understand what that probably means. And there was a fully accredited post office because uh, the South Orkneys produced their own stamps. And so all the world's stamp collectors would send in requests for stamps. Uh, and our poor old base leader had to act as uh, the post the postmaster general for the South Orkneys uh, during uh, part, of, part of the summer between uh, when the ships came in and he used to have to try and reply to them before the last ship went out. So the first ship would arrive in December usually, or maybe maybe late November. And if you were lucky, the last one would be in uh, to, to um, take our letters out the following March, or sometimes even in February if the, if the ice was bad. Now, this is a painting which was on the kitchen wall at our, our, our base, showing many named locations and features and historical events. Um, if you blow it up, it was, you would be able to, if you were looking at it on, 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 uh, on YouTube, you see to the right there is Laurie Island, and that is where the Argentinian, the Argentinian base is there. And um, uh, in those days, <clears throat> people from countries outside of one's immediate area were christened Western Oriental gentlemen. And so the, that, that Argentinian base is christened the, uh, the, the abode of uh, such people. I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions about that. Um, okay, that'll do for that one. Uh, now here, here's, here's our kitchen. That's Fred, one of our Met observers, putting something nice into the, into the oven. It was one of those four door um, coal fired ovens. And it was particularly good for bread. So you had four different ovens with four different temperatures. You couldn't really set the temperatures. They were just, that's how, they, how it came. You know, you just filled the thing up with uh, anthracite, which is a hard type of coal, and uh, make sure it, uh, it, it, it stayed alight 24 hours a day. And that heated the kitchen, uh, the hot water, there's a hot water tank to the left of the uh, big copper hot water tank to the left of the oven. And um, that supplied hot water for the whole of the base and the heating from the ovens uh, heated quite a lot of the rest of the building as well. OK, and that outside uh, he, here we could supplement uh, by these fish, Nothothenia. Uh, we had this fish trap which we put out during the summer. During the winter, we dug holes in the, in the ice and fished with hook and line. And they're always a very welcome um, addition to the dried and tinned food that we had uh, given to us. Uh, some base members were pretty good at their cook days. So somebody there is preparing um, a, a buttercream and jam uh, sponge, probably for tea, along with a loaf of bread. Um, it was an expectation that uh, there should be fresh bread by lunchtime every day. So you had to get up quite early to do the mixing and proving and all the rest of it. Uh, if you could get rolls on the table by 11, 11 o'clock, that was a bonus. But um, not everybody achieved that. There's me on my cook day. Uh, I'd made the chocolate sponge there, probably, pouring the tea. And... Um, Tea time was quite often the highlight, uh, particularly um, if we got nothing better to do but to stay inside the hut. Obviously, we, when we could, we would uh, go out and um, travel around the island and see what was happening. 
I was unable to do that for most of the time because I had skeds at nine o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock for traffic, three o'clock again for weather and nine o'clock in the evening for weather. So um, I taught the, we had three Met observers and they did 24 hours off and 48, sorry, 24 hours on and 48 hours off. So they could go out on their off days, but I couldn't. So I, I, I taught them enough Morse to send, or two of them, two out of the three anyway, uh, enough Morse to send the weather observations. And so uh, we did a swap and they taught me a bit of Met observing. So I would take on one of their days and they would take on my day and I could get around the rest of the uh, rest of the island occasionally. Uh, there's the ready-use stores, um, things like uh, milk powder and um, salt and pepper and uh, sort of things that you might use every day, uh, tins of paste, um, sauces and vinegar and things of that nature. Uh, and then that is what you got in a box of sledging rations. We issued some of these. Now, we'd done most of the surveying around the South Orkneys in previous years. And so these boxes were uh, located at field huts around the, around the island and around the, uh, also on Coronation Island. Uh, somebody mentioned that um, there was no spam in there, but um, I think everything was supposed to come from UK sources. And so we had to make do with oxtail soup and things of that nature. Okay, and so now we'd actually brought our suits down, most of us, and that's Christmas dinner. Now, we, we tried eating most of what was alive on the island, I suppose, and we came to the conclusion that cormorants were by far the best thing to eat. Um, so that is a Christmas dinner consisting of cormorants, plus uh, fresh veg because it was Christmas and so the ships would have been in. So we had fresh veg from Port Stanley. And there we are all head down. Yeah. Next. Yeah. Uh, so this is, uh, this is me on one of my cook days. I'm fixing the base record player because the, the, the base record player was the main source of entertainment. And uh, once a year we were able to order um, a gramophone record of our choice. And so they'd ended up after a few years with quite a stack of, uh, of 45s and, and, and um, uh, 33s. So that had to be kept going. So now I have, I have having to fix this. And you'll see a wire going up the top that goes up to a stereo microphone. And I was endeavouring to record the somewhat uh, dubious banter that used to go on every dinner time, but they saw this women um, uh, microphones pointing at them. And nobody said a word during the whole meal. So that was a, an abject failure, that. And so we had a, a small amount, rations of, 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 of beer and, and spirits. And so these came out at Christmas and New Year and uh, maybe quarter days or something like that. That's all we had from that point of view. Uh, now, this was a very occasional nice summer day. I mean, you can imagine it was mostly cold and very often raining during the summer. But here we had a decent day and it was Fred's cook day. He's pouring the tea there. We're all enjoying some scones. Um, behind there, you see the pile of anthracite where that had lasted us for the year. And I think the barrel there is probably uh, paraffin. We had a few paraffin lights. So uh, that, was, that would have been that. And also, the, the water was quite difficult to come by at some times of the year. So um, uh, we only allowed to wash our clothes and ourselves once a week. If, they, if for example, if there were seven of us on board uh, the, the, the base, then um, we take it in terms to do a cook day. The following day, you had to fill up everything for the cook of that day and fill up the water and do it. So if, you, if you're filling up the water uh, tanks and so forth, you could use whatever you wanted for your own uh, purposes. And so 
that's me on my gas hand day, washing a towel by the look of it. And of course, no, no piping or anything. We had a, a tank full of hot water. So if you wanted hot water, you jolly well bring it in in a bucket. Okay, and Saturday mornings, we all took turns to do a scrub out. Now you see in the middle there, a bar of soap. All we had for cleaning ourselves, scrubbing the floor, doing dishes or anything else was a bar of coal tar soap and no liquid uh, detergents or anything of that nature in those days. So that was it. And we had a diesel generator, well, three diesel generators. Uh, those are the, um, uh, also the outboard motors for the, for the, sh the little boat you'll see in a minute. Um, so that's Fred doing an early morning uh, start. Um, to start off with, we only had power for from about eight o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock at night. And then we got some biologists to come in before the end of the season, and they turned out to require 24-hour uh, electricity. So it was a big relief that we didn't have to start the things in freezing temperatures. We had um, amples of ether, which we used to pour into the, into the air intake to start the things when it was really cold. Yeah, and so that was that, those are the Stevenson screens that we used to have to uh, read, uh, monitor every three hours. Now, you can see there, that must have been after the rhombic went up because you can see one of the rhombic masts and a rhombic wire which had got some frost on it. So you can see it in the background top left there. Yeah. And so during the, the winter when there was snow, OK, easy to cut snow blocks and you could just lob those into the um, hot water tank. Uh, during the summer, you started off with water running down the, um, the back of the slope behind the hut and we could collect that in barrels and that was dead easy. After that ran out, which it did for several months before there was snow cover, you had to get on a boat and cut bits off um, a glacier, which you would have, might have to go, you know, a mile or so at least to find. And then you'd bring back lumps of ice and uh, put those in the, uh, in the uh, hot water tank. So water was a scarce commodity for a lot of the year. Now, these are what were politely known as the shit tins. Um, we had um, uh, an outside toilet with a red flag that you could raise if you're in residence. I'm not sure, there might be a picture of that somewhere. Um, and uh, we, we had a wooden toilet seat just suspended over four gallon tins. Uh, and that's what, what we used. Now, some bright spark had previously written to the uh, editors or the letters to a couple of women's magazines. And so we were inundated with copies of women's magazines we, you know, for our use, I suppose. So these ended up in the toilet and um, we used to uh, tear sheets off of this and press down what you'd done ready for somebody else's. So they came in really handy for that. But um, uh, rather than today, where you have to carry everything back, uh, if these were full, when these became full, they either went out on the boat and dumped in deep water or taken out on the ice. So here we are, uh, three months' worth of um, uh, produce uh, waiting disposal. And uh, this was a cat that we f appeared on the base. Well, it was, it was on the base when we arrived, but uh, we had some moss out the back and it was a nice day and he could lie out and we fed him bits and pieces and uh, he was all right. A bit, un a bit unexpected. Now, here's the, here's the radio shack at Sydney now. On the left, you'll see an RCA ET4336. And it had uh, two VFOs, a crystal VFO and a, uh, an actual VFO, a, a crystal oscillator and a, and a VFO. Um, we used the crystals for talking to the base. 
because the, the VFO is hopelessly unstable. And next to that, you'll see what I'd be spent the previous year building at home before leaving, which was um, uh, an SSB phasing type exciter, which is the bottom handled unit. And above that was a 250 watt um, output a power amplifier. And that had a standard power uh, uh, pie tank. And built into that was a 6C4 on the anode, which acted as a TR switch. Um, just on the edge of the desk there, you see some uh, knife switches, which there we are, which um, would switch the antenna from the transmitter to the receiver. And the receiver is to the right there. I've got my hand on that there. Um, just to the left is the VFO. And just to the right of that, under the receiver, is my uh, homemade um, uh, automatic Morse key, which consists of two transistors and two carpenter relays and um, a piece of flexible plexiglass, which have got contacts um, uh, put on, uh, onto it, which I could um, uh, move, to, move from side to side. So it worked just like an ordinary... Um, a bug key today, and there are two controls, one for speed and the other one was for mark space ratio because uh, you're very difficult to get that right at all speeds. Um, just above the receiver there is a Z match. Now, I had to build that from scratch uh, once I got the rhombic up because uh, I needed something, like something balanced to feed that. And I had the foresight of bringing down with me the loading capacitor and the and the two gang uh, tuning capacitor for a Z match and I found the rest of the items in the spares kit to, to, to make that um, so that's about it that's the station um, and here's the antennas that I inherited now this is an interesting picture this because it shows the the, 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 the two masts there so there was one short antenna and one long antenna. And um, they both went uh, be between the two masts. And then somewhere between the masts, they were fed down to the roof of the shack and into the shack. Um, there's also a jetty there, which was perfect for loading stuff and plenty of space to, to put things on. Uh, bottom left is a generator shed. Um, and uh, that's about it. Okay. Now, while I was there, having, having been distinctly unimpressed with this antenna, which is perfectly good for talking to Port Stanley, but no good at all for anywhere else, um, I worked out the formula for, for calculating the distance and bearing from Sydney to all the 30 degree intersections on a map of the world. And so I spent a lot of time using log, period, log tables, calculating all these out, and then uh, drew in the, the continents and some of the islands longhand. So um, from that, I could tell that um, a rhombic going the direct, general direction of the UK was what I really wanted uh, to, to, to talk back home. But the, 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 the signal to the US was already pretty good, except for the West Coast. And so uh, that's what I decided to build. Uh, the next one now. And that's the same one, um, took, taking only a few seconds using AZ map. So I was quite pleased that mine didn't look too dissimilar to that one. So now, the, the, what happened next was we, we, we had the two masts which are on the beach. There was one spare mast, and I needed one more mast if I was going to put a rhombic up. So uh, the previous year, I ordered a, one additional mast and 500 metres of um, aerial wire. And that duly came on the first ship uh, towards the end of October or November. And um, at that point... I then had to remove the bases from the existing masts. And there I am with a jackhammer or some sort of petrol-driven um, hammer to break up the concrete to get out the, the mast bases. That was 
That was stage one. Uh, stage two was um, mixing the concrete for the, for the new bases. So I had 20, uh, 20 um, concrete blocks to make, four for the mast bases and another 16 for the guy points because we we're on a ski uh, uh, on a, uh, a scree slope uh, behind the hut. And um, this was somewhat movable and it got permafrost underneath it. So uh, I had to put some sort of decent uh, foundation for the, uh, for the mast for that. I uh, later learned that uh, this was still going 20 years later, even though I was only concerned about my time there, to be perfectly honest. But um, it was a reasonable job in the end. OK, and that's us pulling it up. Uh, that's a falling derrick we used to get the masts up. They're jolly heavy uh, steel masts. And you see the dog there is trying to um, uh, attack one of the guys at the back there. So they weren't helping at all there. Uh, the dogs used to come out and help us, or you, we used to take them out walking when they weren't working, you know. Okay, now this is the rhombic complete, completed now up the back of the slope. Um, so that slope had a lot of space. And uh, to be perfectly honest, I was quite surprised that the 2011 team didn't uh, see if they could use that same site because it was so much better than the shithole, which was the uh, um, uh, water pipe beach where all the seals were. No seals ever went up as far as that. And you had a perfect takeoff uh, right round to... Um, the west coast of the States and um, over to uh, the UK. And you also had a reasonable takeoff over the back because there were bluffs at the back, but I got quite good results uh, going across to Australia and Japan, which was in the alternative, uh, in, the, uh, in the reverse direction. Obviously, the rhombic was unterminated because I didn't want to lose any power. Okay. And now, this was... Um, the contest which I particularly wanted to have a go at. Uh, this is the British Empire Radio Union, or now known as the Commonwealth Contest. John knows all about that. And um, I don't know whether you've seen this, John, in, in, its, in, its, in, in the flesh, but it appears at the presentation every year. And, um, of course, it's not allowed to be carried out of the UK because it's a, a solid silver and fairly valuable item. But I noticed that 1981 was your first win there. And then you got another one in 92. Uh, I don't know if there was any other further down there. But this is when, but round about when you started your, your main effort on the, on the Baru contest, John. Um, so I, I first entered it in, in uh, 1962. Uh, using the old antennas on the on the beach, and I did you know reasonably well, but unfortunately the contest was in March and the ship had already sailed, and so my log never got got past um, the the post office in Sydney. So uh, there was a little note the following year when it finally arrived to say that uh, Peter's VP8GQ's log was about nine months late. But there we go. Uh, that's that one. And, okay, so one of my jobs was to uh, test the ice. So I used to have to go up, up to the top of Coronation to look at the ice out to the north to, because that's the way the ships came in. And uh, so that was um, one of my tasks was to check the ice. And uh, here we got new ice in Factory Cove. Um, Coronation Island, there was an ice cap on Sydney, and so you could go up on there and see uh, Coronation Island in the distance there. And the following one, now this is an interesting one because you can now see the whole shape of Sydney there. This is on the uh, ice cap on Coronation, which we could go across because you can see the sea ice in there. Now, the, 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 the base that we had um, 
was not far from the left-hand edge of the island, just to the right of the guy standing there. Now, if you just follow along to the right a little bit, very slightly, go down a bit, down there, there is where the hut is. That's where the hut was. And um, there was a whole of that slope there. It doesn't look very big at the time, but the whole of that slope there was perfect. Um, now, over on Waterpipe Beach, which is over further over to the right, rather than said a little bit further over to the right, really, further over in, 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 in that sort of area there, um, you've got a problem with Robin Peak, which was that tall uh, peak in the foreground of Sydney there. There, uh, that that would have um, spoiled the takeoff to the states altogether. I would have thought. Not only that, but in that flat area, uh, it was seal country, and so um, although we didn't have any fur seals when I was there, the, the fur seals had effectively been made extinct by the sealers uh, in the early years of the so Well, maybe by the maybe by the by the 30s or 40s. Um, and now, of course, as John will know, they've come back with a vengeance because uh, there's nobody there to knock them off anymore. Uh, so that was Sydney Island. Yeah, and okay, so this was the dogs on one of their comparatively rare outings. We only had four dog, four, four, four dog teams. So we had two, uh, two teams, eight dogs altogether. And uh, the, most of their time, it was because we could only kill a seal some distance from the base. And so it had to be sledged back. All the dogs needed seven pounds of seal meat every other day. And so that's how they lived. I suppose that's how they lived in the wild, really, uh, when they were um, up north where where they originally came from, these dogs were Inuit dogs and they only understood uh, the Inuit names for, for, the, for the commands, uh, Alk and Ira and uh, so forth, left and right. Um, uh, so this, the, the, the whole, uh, the, uh, the idea that you said mush to a dog is absolute rubbish. I don't know where that came from, but um, uh, these dogs understood Inuit quite well, and, and, and they were pretty good at, um, at uh, what they were supposed to do. And that was an, a, a, another calm, rare calm day uh, out on the boat uh, over the other side of uh, Sydney Island, out to the east. And uh, there are the two uh, Sandyford Peaks. It was a lovely... Um, area of coronation off to the left, um, which we always love, would, would have loved to have, go, to, to, to have gone there, but um, it was never really possible because the, either the sea was too rough for the boats or the sea ice never extended sufficiently far in that direction. And here is Fred um, after I taught him Morse. Um, this was a field radio on uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, field sites. And I did use that once, and um, you could just about get. I I I, I think I worked uh, one G station and uh, one US station. The problem was you had no netting, so when you sent sent your um, uh, your message, you got no idea of uh, uh, on the receiver where you had been. And so the only way of, 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 of contacting anybody was to call CQ and see if anybody came back. And it happened about twice. Oh, this was a, a 15 watt radio or something like that with hardly any aerial. Um, so we used it mainly for talking back to the base. And we did our own photography. Uh, we had a dark room. Uh, most of it was black and white, but it was possible to, to do colour, although you had to be very, very careful with the temperature because um, temperature is critical, as you may know, when, you, when you're developing film. Now, this particular photo uh, was a, a pride of mine because um, 
uh, I had an old 1940s exacta camera which was a, a sort of single lens reflex and you had to look in the top uh, to see the the uh, the image it wasn't a viewfinder as such and um, I fitted this with uh, the objective lens lens from a pair of ancient binoculars which one of the divers had recovered from the bay uh, because it was only a 50 millimeter lens on so, and so I wanted something with um, a bit of uh, telephoto capability. And this was taken with, with this combination. Uh, the detail on this photo is not brilliant on the, uh, on the PowerPoint, but you can see every hair in a French beard there. And so it worked quite well, I thought. Uh, this is the largest bird on Sydney Island. It was a giant petrel and um, they, could take off from water, but they had great difficulty. Uh, they had to run a long way to get off. They laid enormous eggs, and um, we had we, we, all the birds were ringed. Um, some of the some of the people were quite interested on the base with with, uh, with that side of it, and we had recoveries all the way from New Zealand from these giant petrels. And these were shags or cormorants. And uh, there were plenty of those. And so we didn't really fuss too much about knocking a few of these off for the kitchen. Uh, these are the terns. And they were small, quite small birds, but they were really fierce. You see the female is on the nest there. And uh, the male is eyeing me up because uh, he was afraid I was going to go off with his eggs. There they are. And here we've got a pet and a daily uh, nesting site. And as you see in the center, they are already at it. Um, now, the interesting thing about these colonies is that everything happens simultaneously. Um, they all appear one day, they come up, they find their nest from last year, or if they weren't here last year, they find another one on the outskirts. Uh, they pair up, they mate for life, and um, then after, after, after due time, they lay one egg, and then they lay a second egg. Now, we learned that penguins can count up to two, and how do we know that? Because <clears throat> if you wait until they've laid the two eggs and then you take one, they think, oh, well, two, two eggs, I've done my bit, so I'm not going to lay any more, so no more get laid. If, however, you go around when they've all laid their first egg and you take as many as you like of, the, of their first eggs, then they will lay two more because they think, oh, shit, you know, um, we've got to lay two eggs here and uh, they've forgotten about the first one. So that's how we ended up with our eggs. We did no harm to the colony at all, but we ended up with a whole year's worth of eggs. Uh, we, we also know that they kept to the same um, uh, nesting, exact nesting site because we, um, we divided the colony into three and we went round with tins of red, white and blue paint and we daubed sex, sectors on their heads with different coloured paint. And then you go up on the bluffs and you could look down and you could see what you'd done, you know, they were all divided up. And so the following year, okay, there were a, a, a few missing and so forth, but they were still more or less, more or less in their same uh, positions as, as the previous year. Okay, so uh, next one now. Uh, and here, here is Fred um, measuring up uh, the eggs from the different varieties of penguins that we had. And uh, this is prior to, um, next one, prior to stacking them away in flour, we discovered that we had far more flour than we really needed. And so you could get a tin of flour and you could just put these eggs away, buried in the flour, and they would last a whole year. I mean, to start off with, you could, you could boil them and then you could use them for omelettes and then later on in the year, you could use them for cooking and cakes and things of that nature, but they never really went off. 
Um, this is a giant petrel egg. Now, it was a bit naughty, this, because there were not that many of the giant petrels, but we did actually steal this one. And uh, this, is, this is Pete, our base leader, polishing off um, a giant petrel egg. And it is really big, I tell you. But they're okay to eat. I mean, a little bit fishy, but they're okay to eat. Yeah. And this is what happens up on the, uh, up on the, uh, the slope where we you see the span there where we've, we've um, uh, put this dog. And the, the penguins come up occasionally and the dogs sit right at the back of the farthest reach of their chain and they know exactly where their circle of control is. And a penguin comes up and steps into that area of control and it's gone. So uh, quite a few penguins were lost that way. Um, this is um, over the, across the Bay of Elephant Flats, not far from um, Waterpipe Beach, where the uh, elephants had their harems. And uh, this bull elephant is at least two tons, probably more, preparing to charge me. So uh, you see no footsteps going in his direction. Uh, I mean, they are very dangerous. Uh, so, as I said, each dog needed seven pounds of seal meat, and so we had to um, uh, kill a seal every, every week or so to um, feed our eight dogs. Um, this particular one had been killed right up to the base. Now, uh, this picture here, you can see just to the right, there's a little building marked T's, and there's a flagpole, a little white flagpole, and that is the outside toilet. Um, but coming back to the meat, um, we, uh, if, if, uh, if there was a seal killed close to the base, we would bring a, uh, a decent piece from the, from the hind quarter into the cook to cook for supper. And um, on this particular occasion, they brought it into me in a bowl. It was probably about three pounds of meat. And it was in one lump. And it was in the bowl and it was writhing. It wasn't still, it was actually moving. Just this piece of meat, it was moving. And I put my finger onto it to touch it and it shied away from my feet, withdrew from my finger. So this piece of meat was still alive. And I have to say it was, it was really delicious but it made you shit absolutely black, I tell you. It was, there was so much, um, I don't know what it was in it, but uh, it was a very dark meat and uh, it went all the way through you. Okay, and here we go. This is the uh, RS Shackleton again, ready to um, pick us up. Uh, appears at Factory, Factory Co for the last time of the season. Um, it's obviously it comes for the first time uh, in November, so that's when we get all our mail and things of that nature. And uh, for the last the last visit, we send all our stuff out. And that, gentlemen, is the end of the presentation.